Listen, listen. This neither begins nor ends with me, not such a hate cascading down time, crossing sea and sky and continent, a hate that sails beside friendship, love, fealty, so many skiffs. I could not say where it began, perhaps only the stars can, for beginnings come clothed in mist. There are many who will claim to know, Vyasa foremost, but even saintly bards, especially when sons, don't allow tales to travel unadorned. And so I must uncage the quieter lore, let them wander, rags and slander notwithstanding. There may be rhyme, but not much reason, little meter, but both stress and distress. This is not the whole story, nor a lyrical history of mankind. It is what I know to be mine, true, or nearly so, for truth is a beast more wavered than time. Hi, that was Satyavati, a series of poems called Fault Lines. And um, Satyavati's is the voice that sort of forms the vertebral column of the book. Hers is the diegetic voice. The entire book consists of 18 other voices, all of whom come in to tell their story, their point of view, or their vision of the truth. Satyavati's is the only one that provides a certain narrative constancy. So I thought I'd begin with that. Also to position the book, because as she says, this is not the whole story, nor a lyrical history of mankind. And that's a, nor a, a lyrical history of mankind is actually a phrase I borrowed from Peter Brook's Mahabharata, because in his Mahabharata, that's how Vyasa describes the story. He tells the little boy who forms kind of the narrative uh, impetus, there's this nameless boy who's, to whom Vyasa tells the story in, in Peter Brook's Mahabharata, and this is what you know, Vyasa says. What you're going to listen to is a lyrical history of mankind. And I want to sort of counter that position or have Satyavati counter that position and say, you know, the truth is always a very slippery beast. Um, so that's it. <laughs> that was the way I wanted to um, kind of introduce the book because that's really also the purpose, I guess, of the telling, that there are many tellings and you know, whether it is valid or not really depends on where one stands and the attempt is to be as true as possible to individual voices. But there is no overarching truth if it's not for um, a, a later thing, she says, which I'll uh, read a bit of as well. This is actually comes right towards the end of the book when Vyasa comes to credit Satyavati to tell her that the future is going to be really, really dark and perhaps it is time to renounce worldly ties because she would not want to live through what is happening and that's a discussion which I think forms the crux in this telling at least of the moral issues that they're grappling with. So this is Satyavati speaking first, and then Vyasa. Bewildered and distraught, I interrupted. But surely no child is born evil, Vyasa. Given the right care with the right values, surely we can save them still. I cannot bear to surrender without trying, nor to abide thoughtlessly by cosmic visions and rumor mills, to be these sights so demonic. Vyasa's shoulders stooped at that. He bore the pain of centuries. No, mother, no child is born evil, on that we full agree. It is not evil itself that will plague our descendants, initially, but hate. Almost the same thing in effect, alas, though not in cause. 
Many good men hate and will destroy wantonly in their hate, yet reject the notion of evil influencing decisions or actions. These children, mother, are being brewed in hate and steeped in it they will grow. How many hates will you battle? Assailed by all the colors and tones of hate in the universe will the Kurus be. Hate that will play every instrument to sound a symphony of doom across the firmament. So many rhythms and colors emanate from that hatred, mother. Our eyes and ears may crumble and desiccate at their advent. At the near beginning stands Umba's hate, a hate that consumes planets and stars and comets, that transcends, why, owns time. Hate that will resound as Bhishma's nemesis, the warrior Shikhandi, soon to be born to Drupad, a king who will embrace hatred as his lifelong consort. In the nearby land of Panchal, Amba Shikhandi, who will transform from woman to man by the sheer might of her vengeance, who will plague Bhishma with the memory of desire and wrong until the day he shall perish. Add to this the silent, frightened loathing of Ambika and Ambalika that flowed on leaving their latterly quietened souls into Hastina's muds and rivers, and perhaps their children's blood. Or take Gandhari, whose wounds throb and bleed as unending virtuousness, righteousness, sorry, sainthood more virulent than any wickedness, except the malignance of her brother, Shakuni, orphaned by Shkuru forces and forced to meet a blind man wed his sister, Shakuni, who has sown with quiet success, fear, distrust and wrath in Dhritarashtra's once loving heart. Shakuni, who will soon blueprint his hate onto his eldest nephew, Suyodhana's being, will fill the boy's thoughts and deeds with venom to devastate this land. Then Kunti, with a hate birthed by that needless second wife Bhishma brought in to dispel the true rumors of Pandu's impotence. A hate alchemized into impermeable, unbending love for all five children love that will impede all other love and light from reaching them, leaving wives and sons and lovers wounded by the wayside. You talk of values, mother, of training their sights away from evil, but their future preceptor, Drona, their idol, their ideal, Drona is a man honeycombed by hate. By his hostility to Drupad, the childhood playmate who wronged him grievously in later life, it shouldn't matter to us, mother, but it will. For all his lessons, his guidance on archery or governance, statecraft or gnosis will be fueled by this hate. And hate is the Guru Dakshina he will exact from his students. He will demand the subjugate Drupad and annex Panchal. A hate that will spawn more hate, for Drupad will then seek and obtain vengeance from heaven. This is a spiral that will not abate. How can you combat these many legions of hate, mother? Um, since, I, since I started with a mention of um, Peter Brook, I could also maybe just go directly into one of the voices <coughs> most important in the book and also has kind of um, uh, spurred a, a, a dance adaptation and um, that's Amba. I guess for those of you who are familiar with the epic, Amba is the princess of Kashi who's kidnapped on her wedding day along with her two sisters actually uh, by Bhishma and that you know results in an endless spiral of uh, a quest for justice. She has to, uh, she, she seeks every uh, warrior and, and king in the land to, to gain justice uh, because her life's destroyed by the abduction. Um, she's returned to Shalwa, her, her secret betrothed, but he refuses her saying that he, she's second-hand goods and she's been won in battle by another man. Bhishma, to whom she returns, refuses to marry her because of his vow of celibacy and she therefore takes an oath to gain justice. Um, does not get it from any human being, seeks uh, you know, the gods, and, and prays until they're forced to intercede because it upsets the balance of the universe. 
and then uh, is given a, a boon by Shiva that she will be able to defeat Bhishma, but only by being reborn and transforming into a man. Um, and I was very struck by, um, I'd seen it a long time ago, but when I watched it again, I was very struck by how Peter Brook handles the character of Amba in um, uh, and actually an anachronistic sequence that he creates to have Amba and Draupadi confront each other. So just take a look at that, it's just two minutes, and I'll just ah. read after that. Where is Bhima? Do you need the lights off? Can you see? I'm looking for Bhima! Where is he? Bhima! Bhima! I'm looking for Bhima. I'm looking for Bhima. Where is he? I am Bhima! What do you want? I was told I would find you in the forest and that you are the strongest man in the world. It's true! You must fight for me. Against whom? Against an old man. A proud and ferocious old man. Against Bhishma. Bhishma? Impossible. I love and respect him. No one would risk himself against him. He can only die if he wishes for death. He is invincible. Who are you? I am Amba. Because of Bhishma, long ago, the world rejected me. You are really Amba? It was more than 40 years ago. Hate keeps me young. I only live to kill Bhishma. I swore it. But all the men to whom I turn, even you, Bhima, you all tell me he can't be killed. Nonetheless, I will kill him. To find the moment that ends his life, I have all eternity. Rest. Free yourself from this wish to kill. Why do you always propose peace, forgiveness? Amba, don't only search in this world, pray to the demigods, call upon invisible forces. For 40 years I've been searching everywhere. No force can outwit death. Except death itself. Who spoke? Death. Who said except death itself? How can death? I haven't handled a PC in ages. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, there's a small lag between visual and speech, but. Otherwise, as you saw, the, the, as you saw, there's Amba is the focus of that scene, and what you see is her <coughs> relentless, you know, um, quest for justice, and how that's denied by everyone, even someone like Hima. And so that gave this poem, which is in five movements, which alternates between Amba remembering what happened to her and Shikhandi, who is a complete war machine focused on just that one thing, which is destroying Bhishma, and it moves between two poetic forms as well. Um, so I'll read that and I'll show you what that becomes actually in dance and a partial adaptation that's been made of the book. So this, this poem is called Manual for um, well, it's, it's, in, it's in double voice, as I said, you know, Amba's and Shikhandi's. Um, and it's, it's called Manual for Revenge and Remembrance, with uh, the revenge part being Shikhandi and the remembrance part being Amba. For it is time, for it is I. The two stories you cannot flee, we are your death and destiny. To this time I shall battle you unfettered, free of my female frame, free as the primeval seas. This time, I traverse death and rebirth and lease, no, beg manliness from a yaksha, nameless tree sprite, lord of the night. This time, there'll be no debris of woman in me, my head grows sunwards, my knees and back hard, unbending. 
The voice, the voice unreels into bark. I scour softness, scrub grace from the skin till what glows is pure steel. Unfurl my womb and fly it, dripping rust as pennant, perhaps shroud. Then peel and burn the breasts. This time we meet. Neither shall win, for I will slay you, but first you shall watch me die. So begin, begin to begin, begin to end. March arm in arm with death towards your vengeance, the vengeance you nursed like a firstborn. Name and number the iniquities of the enemy, nail grief, needle wrath, narrow its gaze on that single being, obliterate all others for practice. Warriors, archers, charioteers, order your army to excess. Overrule elders, counselors, judge and jury, outlaw poets and peacekeepers. Pursue dharma, but at casual pace. Persecute those dearest to the foe. Plague him. Plague him till he prevails. Prepare to see present and future quashed. Nephews, fathers, sons quartered. The women questing for lost kin. Yes. Quiesce and quaff your impending victory, your irrevocable loss. Revel in its flavor. Recall that first. Resurrect the lost years, the yearning. Release yourself from oath and loathing. Sound the kettle drums, the conscious. Salute the foe and strike. Strike that spear through gullet and lung and ligament. Shatter his skull, tread might and right and thought to blood, bone, gristle. Snuff out your soul, triumph. mother of Draupadi and Drishtadyumna and Anshikhandi himself. Um, so Drupad, who all his adult life, um, you know, concentrates all his energies, all his purpose towards gaining vengeance on Drona. Well, not all his adult life, but after half his kingdom is annexed by 
um, the Kuru prince's forthrona, and has these children whom he instills with a single purpose, which is to, to um, take revenge on, on Drona. So this is in the voice of the, the queen, whose name is never given in the Mahabharata, but um, whom I imagined um, surrounded by these various kinds of hate. So the poem is, funnily enough, called Sustenance. And it's um, actually written as uh, Bhakti. Anger. We eat anger at each meal, night and noon, mostly Drupad, monarch of Panchal. And our three children, though I have to swallow my share too, this is a staple. Anger. The shoot's burgeon, it grows, unfurling fibrous, sightless roots through castle walls, through words, veins, and arteries. The leaves cover rooftops and thoughts they color tongues. For Drupad has raised our children, Shikhandi, Pishma's nemesis, Drishtadyumna and Draupadi, fireborn twins, seraphs, slayers, as battlements, as lethal weapons. Words transform flesh, marrow, and bone into granite, iron. Words forged our children, not words like love, hope, laughter, desire. No, those belong to foreign lands, to alien tongues. The words that alloyed them, smelted heroes, now dwell in granite bones. Honor, rage, revenge, and purpose, polite, unfailing that estrange even my aching mother's heart. But they were never mine, these brands from Drupad's inferno, fury that first engulfed his soul, now all of Panchal, not mine. Even young, they had suckled paternal dreams. For dreams seep into neighboring heads, theirs traverse my own each night. Drupad's dreams, where enemies stand crowned in shame, where blood and breath turn black and tidal rocks tear down skies. While Shikhandi, whom I had borne as a bubble beneath my breasts through nine months of eternity, dreams yet again of the horrors of the past, of future terrors. In these dreams, Shikhandi crushes both breasts and unwraps sinewed legs, casts shoulder and pelvis in male mold, then carves muscles till they shine, bronzed, blood-soaked, a warrior's shield. Is that past or future? He slips into Bhishma's sleep, a land he has owned for 36,000 nights and days. Honor lies in wait, a quivering, tongueless wild beast. For those who've never tasted love, cannot know hate. And Shikhandi has hated longer and better than most on earth. He borrows rage from the sun, endurance from stars. Hate is thus, said Shikhandi once. I become my bane, unthinking, uncontained flame, eager to blight. He becomes me, he longs to die, till we meet both wander twilight. It goes on for quite a bit, but I thought I'd stop there. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the language brings goose flesh in, in, to, as you listen to it, and, and this is what I meant by this sheer Shakespearean power of the language. And you know, and I know Kartik, having read this, that there are mm, there are many places where I was, and I don't know if you have the book. I mean, I just share this with you that you do really interesting things with print too. So, for instance, there's this one page where. It looks like this. And all of you are familiar with this kind of poetry, where the poetry is going for a kind of a visual appeal. And there are several pages like this. I think page um, 197, um, I marked it. Um, I'll just find it in a minute. Yes, yes. So even, even pages like this, where you're clearly playing with fonts, and um, you know, there are so many, I mean, this. As you can see, the poem is printed like it is a kind of a pattern, the design, and this happens. So my, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is that clearly you're doing some really fascinating things with language, you know, um, both in a conventional sense as well as language, what it looks like. 
uh, on the page. Now, when it is performed, what are your goals? You know, like how do you, how does this, it's like a translation, right? It's like translating into um, just that much more challenging than translating into a different language, translating into a whole different medium. And because you've been involved, you curate dance. Um, what are the challenges? And I'm sure there are rewards also of translating this into a totally different medium. Um, yeah, I mean, I curate dance, that's uh, totally separate, but I've been um, scripting dance for a long time, um, about seven years now, and, uh, uh, and producing dance for a much longer time. I've spent most of my adult life doing that, so it's true that dance is probably much more familiar to me, actually, than, than literature, say. And uh, you're right, it's like translation. Yeah, except it's it's like translating into a totally different uh, syntax and, and grammar. Uh, one of the things, for instance, when Akram um, decided to adapt that particular the Ambashi Kandi story, uh, we worked together before. We uh, notably collaborated on uh, his 2011 dance solo called Desh, but that was really what we call dance theater, dance theater. So you know, the stories were interspersed with conversation, dialogue, with animation. We were going back to a much more primal form of performance here. There's a lot of technology, but it's not visible. I mean, it's not meant to make itself seen. The, 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 the stage, for instance, which is, you know, like the cross section of a tree stump, uh, technically that's far more complex than, you know, other productions that, that we've collaborated on, but it's meant to look, like I said, very primeval, more than, more than primal. Uh, one of the things we knew from the beginning was that nobody would speak. It would be purely kinetic. And that was a big challenge because it's such a verbal, um, it's such a verbal movement, it's such a verbal episode. Um, we kind of brought it down to its, um, its essence, which is just have the three characters, Amba, Shikhandi, and um, Bhishma portrayed by Akram there. Uh, you know, no Shiva, no Shalva, no um, no Satyavati, none of the other characters who actually are very much present in the episode and, you know, trigger some of the actions. Uh, there was It was very funny because there was a Twitter war going on a few weeks ago with uh, this this man who decided that we, you know, kept Satyavati away because of some terribly political agenda. It wasn't. It was just because when you're dealing with dance um, and with that specific format of staging, which is a round stage, which makes things much more complex because you don't have any wings, you have no place where people can enter and exit. So you're trying to keep the story to its essence. You're trying to make things simple, um, but simple, uh, hopefully not to the point of, uh, you know, uh, lack of sense or coherence, but identifiable and archetypical. Um, the danger there, of course, is that narrative needs to contain all the coherence in the unfolding of the piece. And that, like I was talking about in Calcutta, is one of the problematic areas because since we couldn't hide Shikhandi, she's there from the beginning. She, she's not born later. There's no real moment of birth. And for me personally, that was very difficult because that's the real moment of agency uh, Amba has, killing herself and then transforming into a man. Those are two moments, of key moments of agency that Amba has in a story, which is all about going from absolute powerlessness to complete control, even if that control results in, in full destruction and you know conscious destruction. Um, I think the thing to remember, to come back to the root question, is how are you going, you know, what is the end result meant to be? With, with Desh, like I said, we were doing dance theater, we had a variety of media at our disposal. Um, so conversation, dialogue, animation, there's an entire sequence, the, the whole children's story is delivered in pure animation, Abhinaya. And you had a lot more stage to play with because you were in a proscenium space. The round space, the space itself defined what, how you could tell the story. Yeah, and of course, um, you know, the first writing of a story like this is itself a kind of a translation. Because um, what I noticed is, you know, that you kind of take a certain amount of knowledge for granted. You know, having read this, it's really, as you said, it's echoes. It's very fragmentary. You know, it's the earlier parts are given more uh, importance than the later parts. And I was wondering, like, you know, what it feels like to write something with the assumption that the readers know the backstory, which is again very different from 
as I as we discussed today in class, the whole modern notion of creating a new story, that I'm creating this a blank slate. Everything that there is is migration, whereas here it's exactly the opposite. I'm working on a painted slate. I'm working on a deeply painted, engraved slate, which has been painted and engraved for centuries. And this is, of course, not the first retelling. And that becomes a plus point, that you, you, the fact that it's known, that it's there in the collective consciousness or unconsciousness of your audience, certainly in India, probably even beyond that. So how, what does it mean to write with this knowledge for granted, I noticed even when you're talking about the Amba story, you did tell the story here, though I'm assuming many of you in the room already know that story, you know, but there's always that assumption that we need to say. And yet, that you, that's not how you wrote this. You wrote with, you know, knowing that people know the story, so. Um, yes and no. Uh, there are two things. I remember, um, uh, j just to give a summary uh, of my approach, uh, it wasn't to be arrogant, but it was really how I felt about it. Um, there was, there was a, there's a colleague, a Welsh poet, who told me, oh, but you know, it's so difficult. We haven't grown up knowing these stories. And I said, you know, you weren't born knowing the Iliad either. If you want to find out, you'll find out. And, uh, you know, that's my base position. Because it's, these, are, these are epics that belong to, I think, a world culture. And just as one, one is interested in Gilgamesh or uh, the Iliad or other foundational narratives, um, the Mahabharata, like you said, is available for, um, you know, for and accessible in various forms. So, uh, and it wasn't so much, actually I went, I had those two extreme positions. I had this position that if you want to know about it, you know about it. I'm not necessarily going to tell you chapter by chapter. The other, fa the other thing that I factored in was something that one of my editors told me, funnily enough, not the editor of this book, but of my children's book, when she said, you know, you're dealing with minor voices. Even those of us who have grown up with the Mahabharata don't remember them. Don't necessarily remember the names. Don't remember what happened to them. So give us, uh, give us, you know, give us something to go by. Give us some tools. And the book does have a dramatis personae, which, in in about an average of five six lines, defines each character, not just the voices, but all the voices, that, uh, all the people that the voices refer to. That's there. One begins with that. And there's also a family tree. So the genealogy is given because I think, personally, that's the most confusing thing of the Mahabharata uh, or any epic. I mean, I always lose my way between, you know, who's the wife, who's the daughter, who's the stepson or the son-in-law, etc. Even, I mean, with the Iliad, with everything. Um, so those, those were two keys, you know, uh, that, that, um, that I did give. And then there is uh, the, the diegetic voice, even if it's a very personalized voice, Satyavati tells you the whole story. It's not a continuous narrative because again, like you said, it's fragmentary. Her voice comes and goes, but she gives the linear narrative through the book, even what is to happen after she disappears, because as, as some of us may remember, she vanishes about halfway through the narrative, just after the point I read initially, when Vyasa comes to take her and you know, he, and he says, you don't want to live to see what's going to happen now. <coughs> so those, those kind of props are there. But uh, yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't um, giving a, a, a kind of a sequential, uh, sequential narration, no. Yeah, Satyavati is such a fascinating character. And I think you really bring her beautifully alive in, in Under the Lion, Until the Lions especially early on when um, Bhishma goes to challenge her, that, you know, that, that evocative language, I'm not even going to try to capture that, but that how dare you, how dare you ensnare my father, you know, and he can't dream, he's obsessed with you, he's obsessed with, with this parts of your body, he's just driven by this last, his, li his life is taken over, and this is putting, you know, our entire kingdom in, in a kind of peril, and that's where you give her a kind of an agency that you, little boy, you don't even know, and that, that Vish Vishma is so mean to her, you know, he, this kind of royal cruelty that comes out, and even later on he calls her Dase, you know, he continues to call her Dase, reminding her of her lowly origins, and so this is what I find really striking about this book. It's not just about minor characters, but values and sensibilities which we either did not know existed in the Mahabharata or were submerged, or somehow we are politically or 
sort of trained not to think about them. Like, who questions Bhishma? Bhishma is like this noble character, you know, really noble. And yet, your Bhishma is actually quite cruel, quite undemocratic, and the very epitome of patriarchy. So that's, that's something I'm really fascinated, that how, you know, you question these, you know, you know in these values, and how, and, and are these, you know, are, do these values demand to be brought out? Were they there in the Mahabharata? Are they a response of modernity to a classical epic? How did you, how did you hear about that? Um, I don't think they're necessarily responses of modernity because I think they were already there. And, and you know, like I've always said, this three parvas is a striking example of the how, shall we say, self-aware the Mahabharata is or how it questions its own patriarchy. When the women come out after the Kurukshetra battle and curse the men, curse the survivors, curse this whole system, um, mourning, grieving over the dead bodies, over the dismembered limbs. And the sages come up with them, and of course, you know, there's, there's different, there are protestations from the victors talking about how it was a necessary war, and the response of the sages, or shall we say, the, the counselors to the alternatives to conflict, and also the reminders of the rules of war, all of which were abrogated, for instance. So I think there's a lot within the Mahabharata that you do not need what we assume is a modern sensibility, that there are ethics and counter-ethics which are given in the epic itself. And again, like we spoke in Calcutta, retellings are not new. The first moral counterpoints that I saw were in Bhasa. And you know, even if we're being um, at our strictest, that's still 2,000 years ago or more. And, and he brings out you know, the questionable morality of the people we considered heroes already. And with Bhishma, there's this very interesting thing. Um, the anthropologist uh, Iravati Karve pointed out about the generations of women who are subject to his morality. Um, I mean, Satyavati keeps, I, I, everyone thinks she destroyed Bhishma's life uh, without our ever questioning the fact that it is actually for his father that he does it, and it is his father who's overcome by lust. Um, you know, she makes her conditions very clear, but it is not she who inveigles the father. There's a very clear initiative taken here. But even without defending her at all, because she herself, I think, um, maintains and perpetuates and worsens patriarchy in many ways, which, which I do talk about. Um, Bhishma then, you know, abducts Amba and Ambika and Ambalika, and there's another another set of injustices and cruelties which are which are which are um, generated. Then it goes on with Kunti's generation, with you know the second wife who is brought in Madri and and Gandhari being made to wed a blind Rathrashtra. And uh, Karve, Iravati Karve lists out all these consequences. And, and the, the various hatreds, for instance, that I talk about, um, I was referencing a lot from, from her book um, in terms of the, the, the kind of energies that he consciously or unconsciously generated. And she brings out another point which I find very interesting, which is that when you're in an unassailable position, um, and he is after he takes the, 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 you know, the, the oath um, and becomes Bhishma from uh, Devabrata, he is in such a position of unassailable morality that that morality itself becomes uh, the major issue. It is unbending. It is um, uh, it is unseeing of other humanities and and you know um, the uh, the the other necessities of human beings. It has just that one unswerving path. And I think that's there's a lot about righteousness uh, and the as opposed to right righteousness as opposed to right and the destruction that that catalyzes. It's fascinating. It's almost it's, um, radical and fundamental at the same time. I mean, um, but I have to ask you that inevitable question that we live in times which are, you know, in some ways very intolerant of um, any kind of reversal of values or attitude towards kind of the classical, what is um, Hindu religious um, foundation. And I was, I was just wondering, like, you know, since you uh, take on the, literally the holy cows of the Mahabharata, Bhishma being the holiest of them, I mean, um, what has the response been like? Have you had any kind of, you know, um, unpleasant, um, you know, sort of taking? Because you're really, you know, it's, it's very inspiring for many reasons, but I imagine for 
um, because this is the intersection of faith and literature, faith and poetry that we always talk about, that faith is almost beyond questioning, whereas poetry is a constant engagement with meaning. And this, is a, this comes out of a conflict between faith and poetry, or a kind of rich intersection. So have you faced any, um, any kind of negative responses to what you're doing in this book? I think you know there's always there's always whatever one does or does not do one is is exposing oneself these days. Um, there have been negative responses. They uh, mainly about the fact that these are and I quote uh, you know product of a modern political sensibility and that's when I love quoting Bhasa or quoting the earliest of the challengers, if you want to see them as challengers, which I don't. I think the epic in itself provides so many different moralities that it's it's the best example of uh, a palimpsest and of of, of um, social and political order changing through times. And for me, it, more than anything else, it's been it's been a work of literature. It's it's an oeuvre. It, 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 you know, it's a literary opus before it becomes anything else. And if you look at if we are to believe it is as ancient as it is, in the times when it was maybe, well, it couldn't have spontaneously self-generated, but it was you know, recounted and then before it became a written tradition, those were times when different gods were, were paramount. Uh, you know, gods also have their times and, and their rise and fall. So um, faith in the absolute sense of faith, who are you being faithful to? I um, want to invite the audience um, to participate in this discussion. Unless you have something else you want to show, or um, well, I read, uh, you know, I read a lot of voices, um, shall we say, uh, of uh, either non-agency or or, or uh, uh, the attempt to gain agency. I think I might want to conclude with someone who I think had um, a great deal of purpose and 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 continue, you know, attained all her objectives. Maybe that's an interesting, I, I believe a lot of you are literature students. So, uh, and it's a form which you might find interesting because we don't use it all that often now. It's the canzone. So, um, maybe I could um, end with Kunti. So this is a poem known as uh, Osicha of Maternal Conquest and Reign. And it's Kunti speaking to Draupadi about why she would not uh, divulge Karna's parentage earlier. And it's a canzone, so if you're familiar with it, you know what it attempts to do. Um, if you don't, I would really, really recommend reading the canzone because it's great fun. It's just, it's just great fun. It's like, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit like writing a Sistina on speed, and I'm quoting George Sirtes. No mother can ever love each of her sons alike. You should know, Draupadi, you who own two five-chambered hearts, the smaller for your sons, the first for husbands. Yes, Karna is my son, my firstborn, forged as a shaft of living light, rare, brilliant, but an accident. A son I neither desired nor envisioned. The son born of an unsought boon, Arcane spell that moved from a sage's lips to mine. Power to move much more than mountains or oceans. For a son from a god could rule creation, etch your name on myth and history, get planets renamed. Tropathy, you ask why I left him unnamed all these years. Why I never hailed him, my son Karna, as mine. Karna the Fulgent, the name any parent would rejoice, would vie to name as theirs. No, I never proclaimed him my own, though not because he's baseborn, unnameable, as the bards will soon sing. For who would not name the scion of Surya, the sun god who lights the world? Vyasa too, esteemed sage, alighted out of wedlock. Yet his mother takes his name with pride and joy. Kana was an unplanned move. At first, that enjoined silence. Too young, too moved was I to resist the sun god. When he moved towards me, eyes locking mine, I blazed. Nameless flames of purple and copper and crimson moved through veins. Our limbs dissolved, my womb glowed. 
life moved between our thighs, taut and sinuous. But sons, like pleasure, should serve a purpose. I had moved Karna from my sphere, for I saw none. Moving swiftly before my faithless heart could disown good sense. I sailed the child away from his own kismet, down Ganga's arms, first having removed all signs of kinship, save his father's lighted armor and earrings, request to save to light his life. Years later, when his fearsome skills lit up Hastina's skies, I knew at once. He moved in cursives. He quelled like a god, and the light from his earrings drowned midnight. But all this light is too firm, too pure to rule the realm. Namely, not in Sutta breeding lies his flaw, backlit that day by brilliance. No, it is lightness Karna lacks. A mother needs most from her son, compliance, chiefly to reign. The perfect son for that is Yudhishthir, well trained, just half lit by resolve. Were I now in public to own Karna, none of my ch son's child would ever own Kuru. Karna would crown Duryodhan, owner of earth, seed this battle unfought, all to highlight his friend's birthright. No, either victory is owned by fratricide. Arjun is the only name he'll not spare, for their rivalry has been named by heaven, he says. Their duel to the death owns one, that is written. But I'll still have five sons when war ends, he swears. Who that last living son will be rests on who can best perform a son's role, Karna or Arjun, who's armed in his own innocence, Arjun, whose arrows will delight to greet his foe, while sorrow mires Karna's moves. A hero bears no shame, no grace, just his name. Yes.